Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Top Security Lessons from Kubernetes and Red Hat OpenShift Deployments. I am pleased to introduce today's speakers. Um, today we have Matt Smith and Christopher Lillensdope. Um, here we go. Matt is the Chief Architect at Red Hat and he is responsible for helping Red Hat customers achieve their key business transformation initiatives through open source architectures and technologies. He regularly advises Fortune 100 enterprises across a wide range of industries on topics such as digital transformation, IT modernization, and the changing landscape of security and risk. Matt joined Red Hat in 2013, bringing two decades of IT experience ranging from development and systems administration to management, strategy, and architecture. Matt has knowledge in many areas of technology with a particular interest in identity and access management and managing the risk of change, and greatly enjoys bringing open source solutions to the enterprise. Uh, Christopher Lillenstope is the CTO of Solutions for Tigera. He was the original architect behind Tigera's project Calico, the de facto uh, standard for network security on Kubernetes. He speaks at 60 plus meetups a year, educating uh, customers and, and prospects on networking and network security for modern applications. And he consults with uh, Tigera's enterprise clients on security and compliance for their mod modern applications. So before I hand the webinar over to Christopher, I have a few housekeeping items I'd like to cover on this presentation and the webinar platform. First, today's webinar will be available on demand immediately after the live session ends and will be accessible through the same link you are using now. So we'd love to hear from you throughout the presentation. If you have questions for our speakers, please feel free to send it through the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Ask a Question tab on your BrightTalk interface. We will try to take questions as they come and uh, so we'll answer them as we go. But we'll also we'll reserve time at the end of the webinar for a full Q&A session to get to questions we did not cover or if you have additional questions. So that's all the housekeeping items. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Christopher. Christopher? Ah, thanks, Michael. So um, let's just talk a little bit about um, you know, why uh, we're having this conversation today. You know, there, there's, you know, We've been doing security and, and in application environments for, for decades now. Uh, we have well-worn practices, some of them good, some of them not so good. If we're honest with ourselves, some downright horrible. Again, if we're honest with ourselves, but it's, you know, there is, this is not a new concept. So why uh, did uh, Red Hat and Tiger, I think it was important to talk to you a bit about security concepts uh, in this new environment, in this containerized, uh, Kubernetesized, microservicized uh, world. And I think one, this, this slide covers part of it anyway. Um, what you, ah, we've got containers floating above a ship. Um, I think there's supposed to be more containers there. Um, yeah, but let's think a little bit about what has changed uh, as we start deploying applications in these container-centric environments. One, containers start much, much faster. So there's something that can be responsive and very dynamic rather than planned. It doesn't take you minutes or tens of minutes to launch and boot a VM. A container can start in less than a second. You have a lot more containers. It used to be that people talked about clusters of hundreds, tens to hundreds of, of virtual machine servers, and each of those hosting tens of virtual machines. We're now talking regularly to customers, we're talking about hundreds to thousands of physical servers hosting hundreds of containers each. So, you know, when we average it out, you're looking at at least 15x and potentially a couple orders of magnitude more containers than we had VMs. We also have much shorter lifetimes on these containers. Things are much more ephemeral. Think about a VM. We used to delude ourselves that those things were dynamic. They, they sort of kind of are, but they still are sort of measured in calendar time. You know, VM lasts for weeks or months or, or potentially even a year or two. Uh, when it gets sick, you SSH into it and you fix it. Um, it is a long-lived thing, much like a physical server was, whereas containers are ephemeral and immutable and they live on sort of wall clock time. You know, so containers live for hours, days, minutes, potentially even just seconds. And what's more important, since they're, or should be immutable, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about immutability as a security 
um, as a security tool later, if you need to patch them, if you need to upgrade them, etc., the you know the container doesn't hang around. You you life cycle that container out of this estate and, and you bring up the new version. So containers have much shorter lifetimes. So this means that there's a lot more churn in the infrastructure. So all of the practices we had that we complained about being fragile, um, sort of difficult to manage um, at what well, was a, still a fairly static environment, we now have much more churn. Uh, things are much more dynamic. So the things that were problematic even in a fairly steady state environment are going to become really problematic uh, when we, if we continue to take the old practices and bring them into a container environment. It also means we have much larger attack surfaces. There's a lot more things running in our infrastructure, and unless you apply appropriate controls, um, if any single thing uh, becomes compromised, it can become the source of a lateral move. Uh, attack and it, it's all over but the screaming and the and the conversation uh, of, or at least the, the mentioning no comment to the Financial Times reporter when he's writing his first page story about you. So that, you know, and I think another thing which I don't capture in this slide is that we're also now moving from private cloud to public cloud. Usually in a hybrid mode where customers are running both on-prem and in public, but some folks just on public for cloud providers, some on multiple cloud providers. That's becoming very common as well. And workloads are moving back and forth. We're watching enterprises start off and say, we're going to migrate all to public cloud, and then they claw something back. And you know, So there's a lot of platform change as well. And that also adds an interesting security construct. So I go to the next slide. You know, why is this hard? I sort of um, covered some of this as well. Uh, but you know, existing, for example, firewall-based security isn't sufficient anymore. Um, so, you know, we've got, uh, this is what security teams are used to, and we're going to get back to, you know, this is going to be a recurring theme, it's old habits die hard. You know, firewall-based security isn't sufficient for a number of reasons I pointed out just above, but this is what your teams are interested in, This is or know, this is what your security guys know, this is what your compliance guys know, you know, can I still complete the same checklist? So everyone right now, and I think uh, you know, we'll hear from both of us that everyone's hungry for information guidance. How do they make this transition? Um, and I, one of the points that we're going to make here in a little bit, that Matt's going to make here in a little bit, is that this isn't just a technology shift. This is a shift in the way your organizations have to think and, and, and work together, etc. That you know, the old siloed model is not, you know, which is semi-resistant to change in a very dynamic environment isn't going to work. So that's going to add some organizational stress. Everyone's going to try and figure out who's who in the zoo in this new infrastructure. And like I said, old habits die hard. And what makes this all even more interesting, if you're not already, already running for the exits, is that nothing's truly greenfield. So you can't do a security model where the assumption is you're just going to do it for the new environment because no matter how modern you think you are, you still have that, you know, Sun 25K, excuse me, Oracle 25K running Solaris in some database or ERP application in the back corner that's collecting dust but still used. You've got heritage environments that need to interact with your new environment and then we have an appease mismatch between the old static model and its protection mechanisms and the new model and its protection mechanisms. So that adds another bit of contour and complexity. So that's a little bit of a setup. Now that we've got you concerned, nervous, or whatever else, I'm going to turn it over to Matt and we're going to start talking about some of the lessons that, that both Red Hat and Tigera have, have learned uh, as we've been helping customers make this transition. Excellent. Thank you, Christopher. Great, uh, great setup there. And uh, I, I truly appreciate that reference to the Sun 25K because, boy, that, that brings me right back. But uh, to, to one of the points <laughs> that you just made there. Sparks over 2000. Sparks over 2000, Matt. How about that? Oh, uh, there you go. Absolutely. But with that, that reference, you know, I think that, that calls out the fact that uh, both Christopher and I have been, been in this 
space for quite a while, right? I've been in the technology space for about 25 years. And of course, we've seen multiple evolutions of technology, uh, generations of technology as we moved from, from mainframes into PC style systems, the x86 world, uh, modern virtualization, and now into containers. And Really, you know, we're going to level set here a little bit on what are containers because this space has moved so quickly that if you if you ask 40 different people what containers are and what this all means, you'll easily get 60 different answers. Um, heck, even Christopher and I might uh, might speak slightly differently about them. But you know, at a at a very fundamental level, if I was to ask a room full of infrastructure and application folks what containers are, you would get two distinct answers and they would both be right. And it's very important to understand uh, th this two perspectives on what a container is. So from an infrastructure perspective, all right, a container is a sandbox application process. It's a running process on a, and it's a set of processes that are all sharing one Linux OS kernel. Right? It's a little bit like a virtual machine in that this process is wrapped in some constraints. Uh, and we'll talk about exactly what those constraints are as we go through this presentation here. Uh, but, but it's wrapped so that the process thinks that it's isolated and that's running by itself, much like it would in a VM. Um, but fundamentally, unlike a standard running process uh, executing on a Linux host, uh, the nice thing about a container is that's very portable. You can pick this thing up very easily and move it from host to host and know that it's going to run very predictably in all locations. Right? However, to the application owner or the application developer, the container really represents the next generation of application artifact. Rep represents this, this deployable component, the next generation of what we've always looked at as WAR files and EAR files or egg files in the Python world or you know, even just traditional zip files, a way of packaging up my application dependencies with one unique element here in that a container is language and application neutral and it bundles in not just the application but actually that application's app server as well as all of the dependent pieces of a Linux operating system. So you actually end up with this container having a not insignificant number of Linux bits inside and that has a significant impact on our, on our security conversation for today. Um, Similarly, as an application artifact, this is now what we drive through our CI-CD environments. That's a continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, it, we drive this container unit through the CI-CD instead of just the traditional application artifact that we used to. But since we're packaging all of these things up into, into these containers, which are portable and represent that new, new type of artifact, it makes it very easy for us to share these components, share these containers, and start wiring them together to build rich, rich applications. So, you know, I, I talk here about the container itself. There's a lot of change in how this operates. It's very important to understand this. But of course, Christopher, there's, there's nothing that changes at the network layer, right? This is still all the <laughs> traditional IP and VLANs, right? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll reference back to what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, so let me talk about, about the network just a little bit. What, one thing I did want to, to, to mention, Matt, as well, um, you know, we're talking about Linux here, and Linux by far is, way is the most dominant container environment today, but I mean, we are also seeing the same kind of um, technology starting to surface in the Windows environment. So some of the things that we're talking about today, for those of you who are Windows folks, also there's, there's applicability. Um, you know, some of the details are obviously different because different kernels, different constructs, but you know, some of those capabilities are, are still there. Um, from a networking standpoint, I think the, the key thing to keep in mind is this ephemerality. Um, you know, things spin up, spin down much more quickly. Uh, that, makes it, um, that makes it very hard for a statically configured or a configuration time thing like a firewall to be updated. If it takes me two weeks to update my firewall rules, which is sort of fast by enterprise standards, but I'm deploying containers every couple of minutes and they all have different IP addresses, there's a bit of a problem. Uh, I think there's also, you know, there, there's also a number of problems as, uh, you know, Matt, it, 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 we didn't really talk about it here so much, but applications decompose into, into microservices. So what used to be a, a library call within a compiled application is now a network call to another microservice. You know, some some uh, piece of client software is going to make calls to 
maybe things that had originally been library calls, but they're now external externalized services. And that means for the, the connectivity graph gets quite a bit richer. And all of a sudden, maintaining security by saying everything in application one is in VLAN one and everything in application two is in VLAN two doesn't really work because things in one need to talk to things in two and three and four and five. And in order to do that, you go through a firewall reference my last comment. So you really need, and I think this will be a theme that you'll get from both Matt and I as we go along, you need security solutions that are not just you know, whitewashed with the term of being container ready or cloud ready, but actually work utilizing and leveraging the primitives that the container environment provides. What does the orchestrator, you know, leveraging identity from what the orchestrator knows about workloads, et cetera. So then that goes to network, that goes to pretty much everything we're talking about. So, so no, Matt, I, I do not believe that the network uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'll challenge, I'll, I'll channel someone from the IETF. Uh, I encourage my competition to continue to believe that. Um, but you know, doing legacy networking and network security in this environment uh, is is going to lead to a bad place. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, and as this complexity stacks up, and, and you mentioned just the, the sheer volume of, of containers, and as that drives a complexity even further, you know, you say bad place. Uh, I, I think I found the uh, containers that you were missing on that, uh, that earlier yeah. picture. <laughs> right. we, we, we do, of course, want to be very careful here. As, as we're building our, our container our, our container ecosystem, our environment full of containers, we want to be very careful how we're stacking these up and, and how we're building the platform that they're going to live on to make sure that, uh, well, that, that we don't tip over in the middle of the ocean, right? Um, and and with, with that in mind, it's important that while we're not going to touch on all elements today, because clearly we only have one hour and it could take days to actually go through this in depth, um, it, it's important to understand that there are many different areas of the container landscape that you need to touch and understand when it comes to, to a, a security perspective on all of this. All right, and it's also important that when you look at the container landscape, and you consider the container, you consider Kubernetes as the orchestrator for the, those containers, and you consider the infrastructure pieces that you'll be plugging in to, uh, to that Kubernetes fabric. So that includes the, the network, the storage, the servers, potentially virtualization, public cloud, and the processes that go on top. Uh, in particular, your deployment policies, your CI CD pipelines. Um, it's important that you compare that against your choices of technology and understand which pieces you need to bring to that table yourself and you are ultimately responsible for uh, versus what is part of your distribution and what you're relying on a vendor for. And of course, as I say that, that is fully a, a self-serving statement uh, in that Red Hat does, uh, does deliver a uh, full Kubernetes distribution called OpenShift, which uh, contains all of the pieces necessary to run not just a container platform, but to build and secure those, those processes uh, that you're building on top of it. So uh, that is a good segue into the lessons that we have already learned. Given that the, the container landscape uh, clearly isn't beginning today and that uh, many have been working in this space for quite a while, really since the, the inception of the modern container with Docker, but even before that, uh, you know, whether you want to go back to uh, Solaris trusted zones or even earlier, uh, earlier models. Jail, number one, jail. Jail, absolutely, BSD jails, absolutely. Uh, it, it's very important, even before we get into technical details, understand that the process and the people are changing here too. All right, you, you have to accept this going in. Do not just stand up a container platform, hand it to people that have existing responsibilities and assume that it all lines up the same, all right? There, there are three key elements that you need to make sure you're coordinating you know, all in parallel, right? This is a next generation architecture. You're bringing in brand new technologies and uh, you collectively within your organization need to understand what that set of technologies looks like, right? You're likely also going to be adopting new 
project methodologies. Agile, of course, being the, being the leader right now, uh, but even within Agile, there are different models of Agile, such as the scaled Agile framework. Make sure that you're adopting your processes, your methodologies in tandem with that uh, new technology stack. And at the same time, this isn't just about realigning responsibilities, but it's about making sure that you're, you're evolving that, that culture as well and making sure that you're embracing transparency and new communication channels between roles uh, as this new technology comes in to make sure that nothing is falling between the, uh, falling between the gaps. Yeah, and I think that this is really important. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more down the road as well, Matt, but... Uh, you know, the as you say, this isn't just IT. This is the business, or at least anything, everything that touches IT. You can have all the agile policies you and procedures you want for developing software, but unless the infrastructure teams follow the same processes, the business ops teams follow the same processes, or at least work in the same time scale and incrementally and iteratively, um, this all becomes really, really problematic, right? It's you know, you, you, you've got to adopt this model broader than just in your application development teams if you're going to be successful. Oh, absolutely. And, and Christopher, of course, a key persona for both this discussion and in the uh, scenario you just outlined is that uh, that role of the security professional, whether that's mm -hmm. the uh, security engineer or the auditor. Uh, it, it's no longer feasible to say, I'm going to speed up my development cycles, speed up my deployment cycles, but oh, wait, I'm gonna put a three day to three week gap somewhere in the middle of this process simply to call up uh, our, our security friend and say, hey, can you take a look at this? I just finished this project and now I need you to take a look at it. Now it is absolutely critical that we include security in with the developer, in with the, the uh, operations team, the infrastructure teams, and start pulling this all together very, very early in this, uh, in this discussion. And yeah, the word journey is in the title of this slide. I, I've come to hate that because it's a really abused word, overused word uh, in, in this discussion. But truly, uh, I, I think those of us that have been in the security side of the world recognize that we're often brought in at the very end of a project just before it's supposed to go live at a point where we are the, the obstacle when we say, sorry, you're not quite meeting those, uh, th those requirements yet. Uh, we need to be involved very, very early at the very beginning of the journey uh, in this one. Uh, there's just no way around it. I agree, but I think also everyone else, you know, these, these other personas that you mentioned here, that we mentioned here as well, the developer and the operations also become inherent security practitioners, right? We can't, we can't just force this off on the classical security team anymore. We've got to, you know, call it shift left or whatever you want, but the secure, and anything we can do in the environment to make this easier, but uh, it is a good thing, but, you know, everyone, and we, we've always talked about this, but still, you know, at this point, everyone needs to become a security practitioner as part of their job. You know, it's, uh, it's, that's it's, absolutely right. Yeah, um, and, and not just a, a not just a security practitioner, but actually start driving some of these uh, these security practices. So when we talked about what a container is, just as an example, we talked about how there are uh, pieces of the operating system inside that container image. It is now critically important that whoever is building that image, which commonly is the developer, starts uh, becoming aware of what that Linux security footprint looks like, understands what their responsibility is in owning the security lifecycle for those, uh, those Linux bits inside the container, and actually establishes proactively processes to stay on top of that landscape and to actually implement uh, new security features, uh, security patches as they come down into that container that they're responsible for. So just as a, as a simplistic example here, uh, you know, when we look at containers, containers adopt a layering structure and it may be appropriate in your organization to start stratifying the different layers of the container and assigning responsibility for the health of each layer individually and this is just at the just at the container layer itself we, we've mentioned already a couple of times that there's some significant complexity in all of this uh, when we look at what the 
timeline looks like. So a, so a left to right view of what it actually takes to build and test and uh, release an application in a short period of time. We need to make sure that we're reassessing the responsibilities of the developer, of the QA manager, of the release manager in each of these roles. Uh, and this we'll talk about in a little bit as well. We have to identify better ways for them to do their job because we're now talking about thousands of containers. We're talking about release cycles in terms of days and weeks. Uh, we're no longer able to do this the way that we always have. So very important early on in the process to accept that you have to have these discussions and to go right after it. I think there's an interesting one which which I don't think we have on the slide, Matt. Uh, uh, you were talking about you know release cadences of, of weeks is no longer going to going to work or quarterly or whatever. Uh, there's another one that we, we haven't really talked about, which is audit and compliance audit. And, and you know, the classical model today of you do a compliance audit a couple times a year, that works great if you have a quarterly release cycle. But if you're pushing code multiple times a day, in reality that compliance audit that you do twice a year is good for 15 minutes twice a year uh, because they audited the application at that point in time and while they were auditing it, you know, people already pushed new versions of the code. So you have to start thinking about having audit as part of this cycle as well, where audit is happening almost continually. Um, otherwise, it's sort of like a broken clock, right? Two times a year, we knew we were in compliance for a short period of time. The rest, uh, and absolutely. And, and, and we'll we'll dip into uh, some additional automation uh, concerns in a little bit here. But you know the the emerging trends here. In addition to CI and CD, we're seeing CS and CA, continuous security and continuous audit, exactly as you just described, Christopher. Yep. All right. So lesson number two: containers aren't VMs. Containers are Linux processes. So understand that if you're running multiple containers on the same host, that this really represents a move back to a shared host model. Uh, and we need to make sure that we are isolating our workloads properly. So I'm sure many on the phone remember running, I'm sorry, uh, many on the, uh, the webcast here, uh, remember the days when we'd buy one large Unix machine and we would run as many processes as possible on it all at once, right? Uh, Christopher, I remember having big Sun boxes and AX boxes where we'd be running databases and FTP servers and web servers, uh, you know, and and trying to figure out how we're going to keep them all secure. But you know, I think uh, simply running them under se separate user IDs was secure enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I ran. <laughs> I ran the entire academic computing center uh, where I went to school was was run on basically two Unix bot, one Sun server and one Vax, you know, and everything ran on those things. Yeah, and and that's sort of the model we're going back to here. But with containers, we have an opportunity to provide some some better isolation to actually wrap some better mechanisms around it than than just user IDs. Now, to be fair. Yes, we're still using user IDs as well. We want to make sure that we are running, uh, running different workloads as different user IDs. Um, however, the Linux kernel itself provides several additional mechanisms that are, that are really critical to, to isolating these workloads. So when you're running, let's say, Red Hat's OpenShift platform, you're deploying, uh, deploying workloads via the Kubernetes uh, layer, and Kubernetes is uh, spinning up these containers on your hosts. When you're running Red Hat Enterprise Linux under those hosts, when that container spins up, it is immediately assigned an SE Linux context to wrap that container in a mandatory access control framework that's going to provide that security isolation. We also wrap it in a set of kernel namespaces. Kernel namespaces uh, gives us the ability to provide some visibility isolation between the containers that can container uh, container processes can't see each other's uh, mounted file systems, can't see each other's process list, can't see each other's IP stacks. Uh, you know, we look to C groups, uh, a core part of the Linux kernel going back uh, wow, several years at this point, eight years, RHEL 6, I believe, introduced uh, C groups for us. Uh, it provides resource isolation, giving us the ability to uh, segregate out uh, specific amounts of memory, amounts of CPU, to dole out uh, network bandwidth and I.O. bandwidth per container, per process, making sure that no container can accidentally or purposely uh, DOS the other, other containers running on the same host. And then the Linux kernel itself 
has some great capabilities, uh, great features with capabilities which limit what a process can do to the container, what a user can do to the, uh, to the kernel itself, as well as SecComp, which is effectively an ACL layer for kernel system calls. Uh, you know, I show here Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but we're actually now uh, going to be shipping two variations of that host operating system, both the traditional Red Hat Enterprise Linux for those that are looking for a full host OS and the ability to, to manage things a little more traditionally, as well as uh, Red Hat Core OS coming from the acquisition of the company known as Core OS that Red Hat recently acquired uh, last year. Uh, and bring forward an immutable Linux host that is a, min a minimal footprint and immutable, uh, but taking what CoreOS brought at the user space and at the utility and lifecycle layer and rebaking that with the same Red Hat kernel and binaries that have been certified across our IHV and ISV ecosystem. So ultimately here, the host is responsible using these mechanisms for separation and isolation of your container workloads. So regardless of whether you're using Red Hat's products or any other product, make sure you're taking advantage of these, uh, these capabilities to isolate those hosts. And just as a, as a very recent example, last week, uh, there, was, uh, there was quite a bit of information around the latest uh, container vulnerability, which was uh, named Run C Escape. I don't know about anybody else on this webcast, but every time I read that, my brain immediately saw RuneScape, going back to the old video game. Uh, the the RunC escape uh, vulnerability, though, was successfully mitigated by security frameworks like SE Linux. So if something, some malicious container got into your environment, SE Linux was providing a sufficient mitigation, a compensating control, uh, to give you more time in being able to properly plan deployment of your patch uh, to, that, uh, to that container engine environment. So make sure you're taking advantage of the capabilities. What do you think, Christopher? Yeah, just to reinforce that, I think you know, even if you're not using OpenShift, all of these things are things you should be using. Um, and and uh, Matt talked about SE Linux, getting on Mac SE Linux context for the pods. You should also be looking at using SE Linux capabilities to secure the underlying host. There's really no reason, especially when we start talking about immutable operating systems like, like uh, Red Hat Core OS, for someone to get onto those hosts and dork with them. Or, you know, it, it, it either from an operational standpoint or um, from a, a potential vulnerability standpoint. So using SE Linux to lock down, for example, some of the, you know, root shouldn't maybe necessarily be able to adjust a networking if networking is under the control of an orchestrated environment. Now, I can, I can say the same thing for storage and other things. So even if somebody ends up in an escape, gets root on a host, they still can't do much if you've appropriately done the SE Linux or equivalent uh, controls. I think the other interesting thing about containers, and we don't talk about host security, we sort of touched on, he, uh, Matt sort of touched on it here though, is because now all the dependencies for the application are packaged up in these containers, it makes the underlying operating system fairly static, easy to be immutable and simple, which makes the ability to do automatic upgrades, etc., fairly straightforward because you're not going to bork an application because the application is carrying its dependencies with it. So, you know, whenever there's a vulnerability comes out, flip on automatic update, have, you know, these hosts automatically updating and, and rebooting themselves a, across the fleet, and you stay current with all those security patches and everything that are coming out of, of vendors like Red Hat without having to remember to go do that. Because I'm sure everyone here on this call always is, is, is completely in sync and, and Patching vulnerabilities is their highest priority, and they hit it right away. You know, day zero comes out, and five minutes later, they're all passed. Right, Matt? That's all your customers are are, are that every, reactive, right? Every time, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, of course not. Uh, it, it, you know, it, it is funny. Generally speaking, it is critical for our customers to have compensating controls in place to allow for a three-month patch cycle uh, for the next convenience maintenance cycle unless it is truly a high-level critical uh, vulnerability with immediate patch availability, in which case they might be able to, uh, to ramp the priority up and get it done in a week. But still, that can be a long time when you're facing a zero day. Yep. Um, 
you know, it's, it's funny, Christopher, I, I almost wish we could take, uh, we, we could turn on the audio for, for our entire audience right now, because I'd love to hear them screaming at the monitor right now. But SE Linux is the first thing I turn off on every Linux system I deploy because it, it's hard. It just gets in the way. Yeah, I'm going to stand it's a great security framework, but if I can't actually get the application running, then, then it doesn't matter, right? Uh, we, we hear this all the time. And, and to those yeah. that have tried and, and worked with SE Linux and, and have come to that, that conclusion, I, I, I beg you, please try again in the container space, okay? The fundamental unit of the container here makes establishing a good SE Linux context much, much simpler because the container framework is actually taking care of it for you. Okay, so please, when you enter that, uh, that container space and you start working with this for the first time, leave SE Linux on by default and understand that when you deploy a container, the container engine is applying those SE Linux contexts for you automatically at runtime. You do not have to do the hard work of figuring that out anymore. So let's move ahead, Christopher, because you, you started mentioning this. Um, you know, let's, let's make sure we're maintaining the hygiene of your containers. You know, I talk with, with a lot of clients uh, about where these containers come from, where they're sourcing these from. And, you know, ultimately, I, I often come back to a, to a pretty, pretty common analogy. We, we all like a good sandwich, right? We all like seeing a, a nice, uh, nicely made sandwich, a little bit of uh, dressing, some mayonnaise, or some mustard on it. You know, maybe it's a, a bologna sandwich or a nice uh, portobello sandwich, uh, some nice fresh bread. You know, th this is like a container, right? We see a lot of these containers out there that are, have already been assembled for us, right? We see MySQL containers. We see Apache and Nginx containers, LAMP containers all over the place, right? And that's a great-looking container. It's a great-looking sandwich. But... Uh, what if that, uh, that, that container, that sandwich, was just sitting randomly on a park bench out in the, the, out in the open? Right? And we're walking by and we're looking at that park bench saying, you know, that sandwich looks really good, but it's sitting on a park bench. Well, do you walk over and take a bite? Uh, is, that, is that the sandwich that you want? Do you just uh, grab it and start eating? So the container space is no different, okay? If you are uh, obtaining your containers from a third-party site, wherever that third-party site may be, including Red Hat's own site. Make sure you're getting them from a known, trusted source. Okay, we ship certified containers. We have a very rich uh, portal that you can go into, and you can actually see the, the health grade that we assign to each of the containers that we ship. Remember, folks, there is Linux content, a Linux user space, inside every single container. That means if there's a glibc vulnerability or an OpenSSL vulnerability or an Apache vulnerability, that impacts that container. Even better, as I have talked several times with uh, many of our folks in financial services, the easiest way to enter the Bitcoin mining business is to download a random container online and push it into your container management platform <laughs> because there have been rashes of containers that are, are loaded with content that you may not have expected, including Bitcoin miners. So be very cautious where you're getting your sandwiches from and where you're getting your containers from. Make sure it's from a trusted source or make your sandwich yourself from ingredients. And you can do that with containers as well. All right. Now, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the fact that it's Linux inside that container. We've mentioned that this is, that this is immutable. One of the important things to understand here is that as we look to maintain the hygiene of our container, as we look to apply patches to it, in the container space, well, these are read-only. You can't just log in and run a yum update or an app get update the way you would have on a traditional server. You actually need to rebuild that container from its source layers with the updated binaries, uh, with the patches already applied. You need to rebuild and then you need to go out to all of those running instances, the previous uh, version, the vulnerable version of those containers. You need to shut those down and spin up the new container images. All right. Uh, the, this is the freshly secured, freshly patched image. And if you have thousands of containers, thousands of applications out there, this can become a, a very burdensome process. So you need to make sure that this is built in to your CI, into your CD platform, that this is fully automated end to end. And you need to make sure that your entire security perspective across the, the entirety of the pipeline from idea 
to uh, writing code for your application, to putting that uh, application into a container, to patching that container, running it through security tests, and all the way out through QA and into production, all of that must be integrated and automated. And of course, that also means at deployment time, we need to figure out how am I attaching this thing to the network and actually giving access to it? Um, but, but again, Christopher, if I recall correctly, at the beginning you said everything just gets static IPs, and this is exactly like networking always has been, right? Isn't that what you said? Exactly, yeah. Um, so you know, let's talk about that. This is what drives that, that comment we made earlier about the fact that containers and pods um, are very ephemeral. And it's part of this process. Now, you might get a little wigged out when, you know, Matt just said you have to, you know, kill all the previous containers and, and stand up the new version. Um, in reality, uh, this is where things like uh, orchestrators like Kubernetes, which underlies OpenShift or, uh, you know, so other orchestrators out there, manage to a certain degree this process for you. You tell Kubernetes, here is a new version of the, of the in case Kubernetes, or OpenShift a pod that's offering this service, you know, make it so, and Kubernetes will then go out and, and life cycle and, and retire the old as it's spinning up the new. You don't necessarily, if you've designed things correctly, you do not have a service interruption. You just, new versions roll out and, and replace, new instances of the new version roll out you know, one at a time, replacing the, the versions of the, uh, the the previous version instances. Um, the other thing, though, to keep in mind, technically you can SSH sometimes into containers, pods. It's a really, really bad idea. Uh, from a security standpoint, it's a horrendous idea. From an operation standpoint, it's a horrendous idea. So I've got 100 of those things out, and I SSH into one, or I say I SSH into all 100 of them and fix them, quote, unquote. The next time Kubernetes uh, OpenShift decides to do a lifecycle you know, uh, retire a host. Uh, you get a uh, auto auto scale event. The new ver the new instances that come up are going to pull from this CI/CD pipeline that Matt was just talking about. That won't have your fixes. So you now have interesting behaviors. If you follow this process, and this is the process that was designed from day one into these these container models you will always get the version that you have blessed. It's gone through the CI CD pipeline, is known, known behaviors, and more importantly, you can roll back. You deploy a new version with this, it doesn't work, you do a get checkout of the previous version that worked and deploy that, and you're back to, to, to good. You actually get rollbacks in your application environment, across the entire application environment, by following this process. If you go in and try and fiddle things like you fiddle VMs, you won't, and you'll end up in a very, again, you'll end up in a bad place. Um, but from a networking standpoint, since all of these things are coming up with ephemeral IP addresses, we need some way of attaching security policies and networking to these things and getting them, you know, so you have the right policies so that the database will only receive traffic from the middleware layer, et cetera. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but all of that networking has got to be driven by the orchestrator because the orchestrator is the only thing that knows what these things are, what their addresses are at this point in time, and where they exist in the infrastructure. Yeah, it, it, exactly right. The, the description there, Christopher, of, of uh, Kubernetes' role as the orchestrator and all of this is, is critical. As much as we often think of Kubernetes as the orchestrator of containers, it Kubernetes is actually the orchestrator of security concerns for all things container security. And that includes the storage that you're attaching to containers when they deploy, uh, how metadata attached to containers is used to locate them on the proper hosts and the proper zones in your environment, as well as locating them in the right network segment and applying the right network policy, right? So Kubernetes, under, having a fundamental understanding of how Kubernetes automates that, that security capability is critical. And that's really what is going to drive the hygiene of your container management platform. So lesson learned here, and, and we, we've seen this in, in many places, lesson learned, make sure you go into your container deployment understanding that your current security lifecycle process is not going to, not going to suffice, that you will be uh, figuring this out in your, in your new container management platform. And that ideally the Kubernetes distribution you choose to use will handle most of that for you. 
So moving forward here, next lesson, keep your secrets out of the container. All right, so this <laughs> is a while for, for folks to learn, and there have been many scans of prominent uh, internet accessible uh, container registries where uh, containers were found that had passwords left behind in them. Right? A, a container is just a, a series of files. So if you're writing code and committing that code as files into the container and you happen to hard code the password to your database in your application's config file and just included that config file in the container, well, the good news is your application will work just great. The bad news is you've now con uh, committed that password to, a, to an image that may not stay within the confines of the environment that you expect it to. All right, so even in other, words, in other about, words, you just committed it to your public Git repo. Yeah, effectively, absolutely right. Um, and and even if it's not truly public, as in internet facing, it is generally common practice that uh, separation of duties uh, dictates that not everyone, even inside your own organization, should all have ac access to every password that every application might need to connect to data sources, right? So it is important to understand how you're going to separate those credentials out and move them outside of the container, all right? So your Kubernetes fabric does provide a capability uh, for both configuration and secrets management. Right? There's the ability when Kubernetes spins up a new container that, the, that, that Kubernetes will mount a tempfs, a, a in-memory file system, uh, into that container where your application can read uh, secrets and read uh, configuration information that it has been dynamically supplied. All right, so we're able to keep the password out of that, that static container image and simply have it injected into the container at runtime. Uh, even further, uh, you'll find many Kubernetes distributions like OpenShift uh, have made that a pluggable API so that if you already have a favorite password vault solution, uh, you may be able to integrate it right into OpenShift, into Kubernetes, uh, and continue to use that for, for secrets management. So very critical. Keep, the, keep those secrets out of the container, do not embed them, externalize them, and push them in either using this, this tempfs model or, or even environment variables. There are multiple ways to, to solve this. I mean, Matt, I think one of the things here that, that people may think that this is what you do when you go into production, right? It's, but I just want to test something out, so I'm going to proof of concept with, with secrets in, encoded. First of all, once it's in get, it's always in get. Absolutely. But I think That's the other problem, and we've seen some large auto manufacturers have this problem in the past, where um, they did a proof, you know, they did a proof of concept without applying appropriate security hygiene. So their proof of concept was just get it out, we want to play with it. That might be keeping your keys in FCD, um, or in, in your pod yourself, or leaving your, your management UI open, uh, etc. And what happens, as I'm sure you've seen, you know, if you POC with that, somebody ends up promoting that to, to, to prod without making those changes. In the, in the rush to get it from test to prod, people forget to revert those make it easy things. So one of the maxims that, that I talk to my uh, customers about is you must pop what you plan to deploy, otherwise you will deploy what you popped. And, you know, so if, if you see this and see, yeah, I, I agree with Matt, but you know, I just want to test something out real quick, so I'm just going to hard code it in there. I will guarantee you, you will go to prod with your secret still in that, in that, in that, in that pod, in that manifest, in that Git repo. Um, so all the things that Matt and I are, are talking about here are things not just for prod. It is things that you must, and, and Matt sort of touched on it earlier, you must start doing from day one. What's in your POC, what's in your test environment, it's got to be what you go to prod. I mean, otherwise it's not a valid test to begin with, but it will be what you go to prod with, even if that wasn't your intent. Wouldn't you agree, Matt? I, I, boy, pre preach the gospel, man. Um, <laughs> I, I see two very 
specific uh, errors that are often committed there. You know, just as you said, uh, what, what, what you pock is what you bring to production. And, uh, it, you know, if you're not <laughs> careful, your production will be what you pock. So let, let's be very clear. The, the POC process, your proof of concept, is generally where you gain your first touch uh, and, and start developing your first round of skills. If you don't clean up your security skills during that POC and really flesh out how that's going to work, it'll be very challenging for you to start developing those later after the POC. When you start realizing, wait, I already gained these skills, I already figured out how to do it in the confines of the POC, but now trying to change those processes means I actually have to change some of the technology. So get those skill sets, skill sets ingrained very early during that POC. And if you're working with a vendor during that POC, make sure to ask that vendor for, for help in identifying what security skills need to be uh, nailed down up front. Two, uh, given that the build artifacts or, or that the build input into the container space is generally a text file, often uh, something called a Docker file, and given that the artifacts are, are pretty standard, pretty stock uh, uh, static container images, it's not uncommon for the work done during that POC to be reused later, right? We, we've checked in those Docker files. We understand how those worked. They're just text. There's no risk here, right? I'll just uh, bring these over. I'll hang on to them in my Git repo and I'll reuse them in production. Yeah, that means if I did it wrong in the POC, I've just carried that thin forward into, into my production environment. So Matt, have you, ever, have, you ever tried, have you ever tried to really purge, really and truly purge a, a Git repo? Actually, I, I have. I have. And ultimately, uh, what I ended up doing was uh, just a, a major file copy. And let me create a new Git repo and check all the files in new and lose my Git history. Yes, of yep. course, there are ways to prune it more carefully with a scalpel, but it is very, very difficult. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so moving forward here, Christopher, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about this. So we've been talking about, you know, this this agile, containerized, you know, everything is, you know, all your application development's checked in to Git, and and all your pod specs are checked in to Git, and, and Matt's been right raz, razzing uh, the networking community, uh, rightfully so to a certain extent of, you know, but in the legacy you're going to have your um, you know, your networking team is going to be logging into each of the switches and configuring things manually. And frankly, that's the way a lot of things are done. But if we start talking about hundreds of racks in the data center or thousands of racks in a data center, um, and you know, doing that even semi-manually is pretty horrendous. That's why we've automated things for containers. So when we start thinking about infrastructure, you know, we need to apply the same kind of agile methodology for infrastructure and for network security and, and, and storage, as, as Matt was mentioning earlier. So let's sort of call this, and it's being called sort of splat as code or infrastructure as code. So if we think back to the way we do firewalls um, today, you have an application and then you have a snowflake firewall set of policies for that application. This application needs to talk to this application, and this application, and that application needs to receive traffic from these applications. Now, some of those might be, say, an LDAP connection, or a syslog connection, or a uh, customer database connection, or whatever. But those are all encoded in the policy for that one thing, for that, you know, so there might be 20 different things that are LDAP consumers in your organization, or 100 different things that are LDAP consumers. So you have 100 different policies that refer to allowing traffic to an LDAP server. So when it comes time for, let's pick on the Heartbleed problem or, or some other case where I need to change the context, so I need to, let's say you, you decide as an organization you're no longer going to allow Oh, uh, clear text LDAP, you're only going to allow LDAP uh, TLS encrypted, so you want to change your policies to only allow traffic to 636 versus 631. You now have to remember each and every application that's an LDAP client, because you need to go change its firewall policies to allow 636 and 631. You will miss it, you will break things, etc. But that's the way we've always done things is it, the policies have been anchored to a thing. One of the things you can do is something we call micro-policies. 
just like micro-segmentation, this is the policy aspect of that. So instead of saying this thing needs to talk to an LDAP server and, and you know, having a policy says this thing needs to talk to an LDAP server and a syslog and the customer database, et cetera, and this thing needs to talk to an LDAP server and an order database, and you then you instead write policies to say things that are LDAP consumers need to be able to talk to things that are LDAP producers. Things that are customer database consumers need to be able to talk to things that are customer database uh, producers. Things that are stage prod need to be able to talk to things that are stage prod but not stage dev. So instead of writing your policies around a thing, you write them around the context or, or the behavior that you want to moderate. Then, because everything's metadata driven in this kind of environment, you can attach metadata labels to things saying this thing is an LDAP client. This thing is a customer database client. This thing is a customer database server. This thing is in stage prod. But now you're attaching, you're basically identifying, and hopefully the developer can do this because they know the code they just wrote. You know, the developer can actually go ahead and say that, um, you know, this thing is these things. And then I have one policy that says, if you are in this map a, a foo client, you should be able to talk to a foo server. And I've got another policy that says, if you are a bar client, you can talk to a bar service. And then, if you're just labeled foo client, the policy is, I'm just allowed to talk to the foo service, but if I'm labeled a foo client and a bar client, then both policies will fire, and I can talk to the foo service and the bar service. The key thing here is I only manage each of these policies once. I only manage the foo policy once, and it, it is automatically replicated to everything that's a foo client or a foo service, the same thing for bar, et cetera. So now we start applying the same principles, this, this automated CICD able set of artifacts that are driven by metadata and integrated with the orchestrator to make things like network security in something that is hundreds of times more dynamic and at scale than what we had before, but actually make this easier at the same time. So we've introduced potentially a huge pain point, but the same technology that introduced it actually gives us the tools to actually make it better than it was before. So, you know, don't, th this process, the key takeaway is there are tools out there that will allow you to do this, infrastructure as code, or policy as code, or security as code, but similarly, you know, you can't, let the legacy, the silos that still exist, that are operating the old mechanism, you will be bringing the sins of the father along with you. You need to take this same methodology and transplant it not just into your developer community, but as we said earlier, into your operations community, your security community, et cetera. So, Absolutely. And you, you mentioned scale there. I, I think it's, it, it, it just adds to the complexity. As we realize that foo and bar could be scaling out, you know, 5x, 10x, 100x even, and we think about the thousands of containers and service endpoints in the fabric, uh, you know, you said it, this is where the, the role of the, the new technologies, particularly those around service mesh and microservices architectures really start to play uh, in trying to manage this complexity and, and drive everything as policies. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that segues nicely into this, this last lesson learned. Just because you've got your container management platform deployed and you've got your, your first three or four applications deployed out there, there's no time to sit still. This space is moving very, very quickly, and it is absolutely critical to stay on top of the, the tools as they are coming in. So to the, to the service mesh or microservices space, you know, commonly we're seeing uh, technologies like Istio and more recently Glue pop up in that space. Uh, we're, we're seeing uh, tracing and monitoring and metering tools like uh, Jaeger and Prometheus pop up. Uh, very critical to, uh, to, you know, all of these, all of this complexity, to manage this complexity, keeping operational sanity over all of it. And, and with that in mind, uh, I, I do want to want to call out something that we've been working very hard on. The existing container engine landscape commonly is implemented as one big fat daemon that just does everything. So it's a, it's a root access daemon. To be able to build your containers, you need to be root or have access to this, uh, to this root level daemon. Uh, everything's all bundled 
up in one. And we've been working very hard to actually separate the concerns of that demon to three distinct parts. Uh, and these parts are now available. And I encourage everyone to start looking at these, uh, at these pieces. So first is Cryo. Uh, Cryo is a container runtime, a very light, slim container runtime that's been optimized to deliver only enough container runtime for Kubernetes to be able to drive container uh, instantiation. And it is based on the same OCI standard that images produced for Docker are. So you can use the images that you have today and know that the images that uh, you create in the future will also continue to work with, with not just Cryo, but with Docker as well. Uh, similarly, Builda is a tool uh, just for building containers. As a non-root user, using even alternate methods to, uh, to what you're familiar with now, but these uh, Builda will build uh, OCI compatible container images. And uh, you know, just as a point of interest, it's named Builda because the primary developer behind this, Dan Walsh, comes from Boston. And uh, one day his team asked him what they should name this tool. And he said, well, it builds containers. Just call it Builda with his Boston accent, and hence the name Builda became the, uh, became the name for the tool. And then lastly, Podman is a simple daemon list uh, command line tool for actually running containers. So you can actually spin up containers, test containers, uh, you know, without needing any daemon. No cryo, no docker, uh, and you can even run this as a non-root user. So you can launch your containers, uh, you can build your containers all without being root, just using a normal user account. These tools are available today in Fedora uh, 29. Uh, Cryo is available in Tech Preview in OpenShift 3.11, and uh, Builda and Podman will be coming to uh, to your traditional RHEL distribution very shortly. So with that, I, I see we're coming up on our time here. Uh, yeah. So I'd like like to thank you, Christopher. Any any last words from you? Um, no, I think you know you, you hit on some interesting things, uh, mentioning Istio and and such. It, you know, this is not a, a steady state. Thing it's constantly changing, so you know you look, you need to look at, at tools, be them things like Calico, uh, Istio, the integration between the two. Um, you know, there's there's always stuff moving in this space. It's not staying still, so you you know there, there's lots of tools out there to help you navigate this space and, and make it more secure. We have a question, but I think we are going to run out of time before I can address that question. Um, so we'll answer that off offline. Uh, regarding uh, IP ephemerality and overlay networks. But the short answer is if you can avoid overlays, you should. This thing's complicated enough, being hundreds of thousands of potential endpoints, adding another network layer on top of another on top of an underlay um, just to get IP traffic around is sort of a bad idea from a scale and manageability standpoint. And all IPs are ephemeral. So you need to make sure that you're not anchoring things to IP addresses, but instead, like we said, to orchestration identity, uh, orchestrator um, moderated identity. But I think you know this is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm you know we're more than happy to chat with folks if they have questions around this. I'm sure uh, Matt is too. But uh, you know, I'll just give you a little touch of some of the things we've learned. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, for Christopher, for a great webinar. Thank you. And we'll talk to you guys later. Uh, once again, a, a copy of this webinar will be available immediately after we end as an on-demand. Thank you for attending. <laughs>